through Acts 1, 2, and 3. I believe we got down to verse number 12, I believe it was, uh, last week. So we'll start in verse number 12 uh, tonight of Acts 3. We may do something a little different here. Well, however the Lord, the Spirit leads, but uh, we may read a few verses and then stop. But we're going to just follow whatever the Lord wants us to do. Uh, you know, last week we started out and we, we learned... Uh, about how the early church was, about how God had ordained and set up the early church, the very first church. And, and then we got to chapter 3, and we found out that Peter and John was on their way to church. Yeah, they went to church back then too. Right. They didn't just do it like we did. They went to church every single day, and they had church with, with each other. Amen. They, they understood that they wouldn't just go into church, but they were the church. And everywhere they went, they was praising God. But Peter and John was on their way last week in Acts chapter 3. And the Bible said that while they were on their way to church, to the temple, to worship and to pray, that there was a lame man that sat by the gate. Y'all remember that last week. Yeah, right. And said that this lame man had been lame from his mother's birth and that every single day there was somebody that would literally pick him up and tote him and lay him down at the gate, which was called Beautiful, in front of the temple. And said that he would sit there and he would ask for alms. He would ask for money. And this particular day that he was there, this lame man was there in front of that gate. On that particular day, God just happened to send two men walking by, Peter and John. And I believe that God led Peter and John right down that road that day. And God had that lame man there. No telling how long he had been there already. For years and years, I assume. But on this day, he was going to ask for something. He was going to receive something far greater than what he was asking for. See, he was laying there, and Peter and John come along, and here this man was laying, and he was asking for money. You see, when you're laying, you're not able to support yourself. You ain't able to work, and they didn't have all the benefits that we have today. And so he was sitting there asking for money to where he could eat, where he could support himself and his family. And this day... Peter and John's walking along, and God tugs on their hearts. And God, oh, hallelujah. This man, he went to ask him for money, and Peter said, look at us. He just went ahead and laid it all out on the line. Yeah. He said, we don't have no money. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Hallelujah. And he said, immediately he reached out his hand, and he grabbed a hold of that lame man, and he pulled him up. And this lame man didn't just get up and go to, to, to hobbling along. It said he leaped up. He jumped up, hallelujah, and he went to running around praising God and, and thanking him for the healing that he just gave him. Amen. I want you to know tonight that sometimes we can't give money. Sometimes we can't give a lot of things, but we've got something, church, that we don't need to hold back. Amen. We've got something that's far greater than money, and anything that money can buy, we've got Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. And he is far greater than anything that this world can offer. Hallelujah, Jesus. He will turn your life upside down, inside out. He will transform you. Hallelujah. He will redeem you and cleanse you and heal you. Praise the Lord. But most of all, He saves you. Amen. He writes your name down in that Lamb's Book of Life. Praise the Lord where no man can blot it out. Hallelujah. We've got something that's far greater than money. We ought to be wanting to give it to everybody we see. Amen. Amen. You know, people shouldn't even have to ask us for it. They shouldn't have to ask. We should be like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about what Jesus done for me. Hallelujah. And I believe the, the church would see the place fill up if we would just quit being scared all the time. I said that word. We're scared, brother. We are scared. Amen. Uh, we're afraid, but the Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed, hallelujah. He said, I'm not ashamed. And that's why you've seen thousands of people coming to Jesus daily. You've seen them getting saved because they were not ashamed of Christ. They were not scared to say the word Jesus Christ. Today we have become so politically correct, so socially acceptable, that we are afraid to even speak the name of Jesus. We're afraid we're going to offend somebody. Listen, I can't help it if I offend them or not. I can't shut up about Jesus. Amen. 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 And we're going to learn that. I don't know if we may get there tonight. Hallelujah. However the Lord leads, we're going to find out about two men, actually a lot more of them, that they said we can't shut up. They said we can't do it. 
not can't do it, we can't do it. <laughs> Y'all know what that means, don't you? We're all Southerners in here. That means we cannot and we ain't. Can't. We can't do it. We ain't going to do it. Amen. We're going, well, you, we'll get to it in a minute. Let me just not get ahead of myself. Amen. In verse number 12 of chapter 3, that's where we got to. And Peter and John and that lame man that had been laying there, he leaped up to his feet. He was healed by the power of Almighty God. And they went in that temple praising God. And the Bible said that everybody that was there, church, there was thousands of people there. They wasn't 20 something folks. They was thousands of folks there that day. Why? Because they knew that Jesus had been resurrected. They was going and a lot of them were just there because they was going there to worship God. Yeah. You know, they had already been going to the temple for a long time before Jesus resurrected. But their lives are about to be changed right here. We'll find out in just a minute. Verse number 12. The Bible said, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel you at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we made this man to walk? In other words, Peter's saying, Why are y'all looking at us for? Y'all act like we're God. We're not God. Listen to me. Church and everybody in here, when we lay hands on people after service or before service or, or whatever, whenever we pray for somebody during church, we're not saying that we're healing anybody because we ain't doing nothing. We're just the hands and feet of Almighty God. He said, you are my hands and feet in the earth. Praise the Lord. You are a, a, a vessel to be used by God. Amen. Remember the jumper cables that we talked about, how God, hallelujah, will send power from heaven to earth. He'll send his Holy Spirit and it connects the power of heaven to the power of earth. Amen. Amen. That's the way we are. When we lay hands on somebody, God, the power of heaven flows through you and into somebody else. That's the power of heaven flowing into the power of earth. Amen. That's the supernatural meeting the natural. Hallelujah. And when that happens... God will work and he will turn things around. Amen. 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 Brother Brooks, I know you can testify. Probably everybody in here has seen something or another. Oh, yeah. But I know. I've heard my brother talk about down in Mavis Restaurant where God, it don't have to be in church. No. Anywhere you are, God is still God. <laughs> in Mavis Restaurant, there was a man that had a tumor, wasn't it, on his face? Amen. Hanging down in Mavis oh, Restaurant, a big tumor off the side of his face. And God spoke to Brother Bruce to go up. And Brother Bruce said, I went up to this man, I just grabbed a hold. And I began to pray the prayer of faith. And the Holy Spirit come through and healed this man. And before it was over with, the tumor was gone off the side of this man's face. Is that, am I telling it right? Amen. 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 Just one or two centimeters. Praise the Lord. Amen. It was leaving, wasn't it? Amen. Edward Lee. Amen. Edward Lee. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Amen. He ain't got that no more, does he? No. It's gone. Ain't Amen. Ain't Praise the Lord. See, it don't matter where you are. God is God. Amen. That wasn't me. No. It was God. It was Almighty God. Let me tell you this. Since you brought that up. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. I was coming out of a uh, Robinson Hardware store one day. Uh, he was up there in Carbon Hill. He pulled up. His daughter's a nurse. Yes. She had cancer. He had her on the phone. Yes. He had me to pray with her over the telephone. She can't be free. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord. The Lord. That's, it. That's, it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Amen. You're the hands and feet of Jesus. And not just Brother Brooks, not just the preachers, not just the teachers. Listen, you are all children of God. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. And he said, I have given you power over all the enemy. Every single one of you in here tonight, you have that power, amen, to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. Jesus said the same power, or uh, hallelujah, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is the same same power that lives inside of every one of you. Hallelujah. We don't have to be subject to being lame. We don't have to be subject to being sick all the time. That's why a Christian should never be down and depressed. Listen, we should be the happiest people in the universe. Hallelujah. Because God has saved us. We're on our way to heaven. Amen. And he's given us power over all the enemy. Hallelujah. We are not... The, oh, glory to God. 
We're not weak. He didn't leave us powerless. We have a Father. Amen. And that's what we as the church need to understand. We have a Father that loves you more than anything. You say, well, you know, we talked about a little Sunday about how well our family loves us to death. Our mamas love us. My mama's sitting right here. And I'm sure she'll tell you she loves her babies. Yes. Amen. <laughs> Sister Sandra, you love your babies. Every one of you in here, you love your babies. But listen to me tonight. God loves his babies. And he loves them far more than anything that we could ever show. God has that agape love, that unfailing love, that never-ending love. Amen. That greater love. Hallelujah. Has no man in this than a man lay down his life for his friends. And God Amen. come and laid down his life for us. Yeah. Hey, hallelujah. He's laid down and shed his blood for us. Amen. So that we can be saved. So we don't have to go to hell. So that we can go to heaven. So, hallelujah, that we can live a life more abundant. <coughs> Amen. So you don't have to be downbeaten in this life. But you can live a life more abundant. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. I'm going to to get back to the Bible study. <laughs> hallelujah. But, amen. We don't have to wait till we get to heaven. God said you can have that life right here. Amen. amen. You don't have to wait. He said, I'll give you sevenfold what the enemy has took from you. Amen. I'm tired of the devil whooping up on the church and the church knowing, hey, that we can take the devil out TKO in a matter of 2.3 seconds. Amen. All you've got to do is by the time you yell out, hey, Jesus, the devil's already running. He's already running because he knows that he is defeated. Amen. Amen. And Jesus has already overcome him once. He's going to overcome him again. And the devil knows he don't stand a chance. Amen. And Peter and John understood that when they was on their way to the temple. They said, this man don't have to be lame. This man don't have to lay here and beg. He's God's child like I'm God's child. And so he said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, praise the Lord. Amen. And that's the way we got to do. Take authority over sickness. Take authority over disease. Take authority over your situation. Jesus has given it to you. Amen. You have the power. Over all the enemy. Amen. And so Peter looks at him. He said, why are y'all looking at us? We ain't the ones that healed this man. Hey, we're just willing vessels for God. Don't look at us. It's not in our power that we made this man walk. But he said in verse 13, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Y'all know that story. How Pilate, he washed his hands. He said, I find no fault in this man. When he was standing before Pilate, he sent him to Herod, and Herod sent him back to Pilate. And, and Pilate said, I don't find no fault in Jesus. What's wrong with this man? And the religious folks, the religious people, they hollered out, crucify him. Crucify, kill him. Get rid of this man, Jesus. Do away with him. We don't want him. And they kept on and kept on and kept on. And so Pilate said, I wash my hands of this matter. Because he knew if he didn't do what they wanted, they was going to be an uproar. He was worried about getting voted back in next year. or He was worried about what the people was going to think about him. Listen to me. Who cares what the world thinks about you? Who cares? Oh, glory to God. Listen, we've got one person that we need to worry about, and that's God. Who cares what the world thinks? I know they think we're a bunch of Bible-thumping, holy rollers, you know, pew jumpers. Holly, but you know what? I'd rather be called a Jesus freak than anything I know. Amen. Just call me whatever you will, but just know I am in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. And I am not ashamed. Amen. And we've got to get our minds made up. It don't matter what the world thinks. It's what God thinks. He's the only one that has the power over your soul. And so Pilate, he said he was determined to let him go. But they kept crying out, no, crucify him. Get rid of him. And so he caved in. Church, we can't cave in no more. The church has already caved in so much. Now look at all the liberties that we've let go. Look at all of it. And now we're sitting back in the world and the devil is laughing at the church and we have caved into him so much. And there's no cause for that because God has already defeated him. He's already defeated. We don't need to give him anything else. Hallelujah. We need to be taking back what he stole. And he said, but you have denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. 
Pilate told him, he said, listen, here stands Jesus, a man who I find no fault in. And y'all know this story. We've gone and studied it in the book of John in our John Bible study. Here stands a guy named Barabbas. He was a murderer. He was a thief. He was a bad crook. He was a thug, if you want to call him in today's language. He was a thug. And he stood there beside an innocent man named Jesus. And you know what the religious folks said and all the people that was out in the crowd, thousands of people was there that day, and they said, Crucify Jesus and give us Barabbas. Let go of Barabbas. Pilate told him, he said, I can let one of these men go. And I can let one of them go and I'm going to have to crucify the other one. And that's what the people said. We won't let go of the murderer. We want to let go of the thief and the liar and the thug and the bad guy and crucify the innocent Lamb of God. Of course, they didn't see him as the Lamb of God. But you know what? Jesus stood there without saying a word. And he took our place that day. You see, because Barabbas, that man that was standing there, that was you and that was me. That was all of our sins that nailed our Jesus to the cross. And Jesus never opened up his mouth, thank the Lord. Oh, Jesus never opened up his mouth. He could have told him right then. Look, he could have pleaded his cause, but instead Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross for him. I count it all joy that I'm going to go to the cross. That all of us who are sitting here today can be free. Every one of us sitting here today can come to God's house and lift him up and praise him and thank him because Jesus went to the cross for us. That should have been us hanging on the cross. We deserve the penalty of death. But Jesus went for us and took it all away. And so Peter's just telling them everything that had happened. He's telling them all these folks, they was the ones that was there. They was the ones that was yelling out, crucify him. These were the very same people, some of them. And he's telling them, you denied the Holy One and the just, and you desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and you killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead. Whereof we are witnesses. Listen to me, church. God don't do nothing in secret. We told you last week. You can look at Buddha. You can look at Allah. You can look at any of these other religions that are, are raising up in our society today. And every single one of them was done in secret. They was done in something hidden. Most of them say, well, I had a dream. I had a dream. But you know what? These disciples would tell you straight to your face like they're telling them right here. We didn't have a dream. We was not sleeping. We walked with Jesus for three and a half years. And then they crucified him. And then three days later, he showed up in a place where we had the doors locked. He showed up in the middle of the room. He come walking in, hallelujah, with hands, holes in his hands and in his feet. And he said, look at me. Don't only look, but touch me and see that I am he. And for 40 days, Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, he walked with them for 40 more days. He don't do nothing in secret. God said, I do everything in the open. There was no doubt. That's why so many people, we're going to find out here in a minute, there was thousands of people. The church started off with 12 apostles and then 120 in an upper room. And within 60 days, there was over 10,000 people that had come to Christ and a life saving faith in him. Why did they have that much of a turnover? Because these people were witnesses. They saw it. That ought to increase our faith so much tonight that thousands and thousands of people, men and women, seen Jesus. And on that third day, we talked about this already. I know it. I'm probably repeating. It sounds like a broken record. But on that third day, when Jesus came out of that tomb, it wasn't just Jesus, but it was all the prisoners that he had went and preached to. They come up out of the ground too with them. Listen, the grave can't hold you down when the power of God is pushing you out. Hallelujah. And that's what's happening today, church. The power of God is pushing you up. It's raising you up. Hallelujah. The devil in the world wants to keep you pressed down. They want to keep you quiet. They want to keep you silent. Just like they was trying to do to Jesus. They wanted him to shut up. He was messing everything up for them. These religious folks had church going just the way they wanted it. And they didn't need this radical man messing things up for them. 
And they said, we're going to kill this Jesus of Nazareth. We're going to get rid of him. And they tried to silence him. But what they didn't understand was that even when they crucified him, Brother Dwayne, when they crucified Jesus, his blood began to cry out from the ground. Hallelujah. Even louder and even louder. And thousands of years later today, in 2018, Christ's blood is still yelling. It's still screaming. My grace it's sufficient. My blood has paid the price for every single one of you. Hallelujah. They're still yelling. They could not shut Jesus up. And I don't know, hallelujah, we're just going to mind the Lord, but we watched something about two nights ago about the tomb of Jesus. Did you know that exactly a century, not a century, what was it? I think it was a hundred years later, I believe. After Jesus resurrected, and they knew where the tomb of Christ was, where they laid him. The, free, the men who were the governor, he come in and he said, we got to get rid of this. We got to get rid of all the evidence. And he come in and he dozed everything down. He tore everything down. I know they didn't have bulldozers back in, Brother Steve. I don't know what they used. But all I know is they tore every speck of evidence that they could down. But let me tell you something today. They missed some of it, by the way. They didn't get all of it because they found it about, what was it, two years ago? It was watching, it was about two years ago when that was filmed. They actually found the bedrock where Jesus was laid on the bed, the holy bed that he was actually laid. Hallelujah, they found it. They tried to do away with it, but listen to me. You cannot do away with the Son of God. You cannot do away with the one true living God. He created this world, and with a, just the breath of one word, hallelujah, he can destroy everything or create anew. Amen. There's no getting rid of God. And I'm going to get back to this. Peter said, you've killed the prince of life. Whom God has raised from the dead. Whereof we are witnesses. We saw him. We seen Jesus. And y'all know every one of the disciples give their life for Jesus. They followed him all the way to the grave. Every one of them did. Except for John. John followed him to the grave too. But not in the same way the rest of the disciples did. They tried to kill John but they couldn't. Y'all know that story. But in verse number 16. He said in his name. Through faith in his name. Has made this man strong. Whom you see and know, yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Did you know that just by faith in the name of Jesus, it will give you a perfect soundness? Hallelujah. And you'll be in the presence of everybody. They'll look at you and they'll tell there's something different about them. There's something unique about them. First Peter 2, 9 says, you are a peculiar people. Amen. And when folks look at you, you will be different from the world. Amen. Just by having a faith in Jesus, isn't it amazing that just even the name of Jesus, there's so much power in it. Oh, glory to God. Even in the name of Jesus. That's why today, church, you can say God anywhere you want to say God at. If you want to say God in school, you can say God in school. If you want to say it at the doctor's office, you can say God at the doctor's office. But you speak the name of Jesus and see what happens. They'll start to tell you, shh, be quiet. You can't say that name here. I can get fired if I let you do that. I can get fired. I can be a prayer. I can do all this. If you speak that name one more time, they're trying to silence the name of Jesus. Why? Because God, they put God's name on anything. You know, cell phones, a lot of folks think that's God. They spend a lot more time on that thing than they do with him, don't they? Yeah. Anything you spend more time with other than God is your God. Yes. Think about it. I'm not trying to be rude tonight. I'm just telling you, anything we put before God becomes our God. That's right. Amen. Anything could be God but Jesus. That's something that's, that's just, that's, oh, glory to God. You can't put nothing but Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is, hallelujah, the bride and morning star. He is the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. He is the one who came and died and lived for us. The Prince of Life. And he goes on right here. And he said, through faith in his name, this man has become strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I want or I know 
that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. Listen to me. He's telling them right here. He said, I understand. Y'all did not know what you were doing when you crucified Jesus. But think about this with me tonight. Isn't it funny to you? It is to me. It's not really funny, but it, it's amazing to me. That blind men, blind men who had not seen since they had been born, they'd never seen anything, but yet when they heard Jesus walk by them, they knew who he was. And the religious leaders, the one that stood and read out of the Bible, the one who stood and read out of the scrolls that they had, they didn't know that Jesus was standing right in front of them. A blind man knew who Jesus was, but the religious folks didn't know who Jesus was. A deaf man knew who Jesus was by as soon as he looked at him. But the religious leaders didn't know who Jesus was. It's amazing to me that people can get so tied up in religion that they truly miss what is standing right in front of them, and that's Jesus Christ. We can get so tied up with religion and going to church and, and doing the church thing that we totally miss Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Jesus is the only reason why we meet on Sundays. Jesus Christ is the only reason why we meet on Wednesday nights. Hallelujah. Do you know you say, well, we come to Bible study. Do you know what the word gospel means? It means the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the reason why we come. Hallelujah. It's to lift up Jesus. We don't come to be religious. I don't even like religion. I don't. I just follow Jesus. He's a relationship God. I don't follow after religion. I don't try to do the church thing. I just want to follow Jesus. That's it. Amen. That's what's going to get us to heaven. A lot of folks get so caught up in trying to do the church thing. We've got to do it the right way. We've got to do this. Listen to me. God just wants you to follow Him, Amen. to love Him, to have that relationship with Him. That's all God wants. You make it harder on yourself when you try to do all this stuff. God didn't tell you to do that. God just said, take up your cross and follow me. Amen. Amen. Follow me. Amen. We make it so harder on than it needs to be. I'm going to go on down through here. He said, I know it was through ignorance that you did it, as also did your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. In other words, all the prophets that had been leading up to this, Isaiah 53, all the prophets of old had been telling them, listen, and these religious folks, they read these scrolls on a daily basis, y'all. They read them and read them and read them. And the priest, they actually had to memorize the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's called the Torah. They had to memorize word by word and quote it before they could become a priest. So these men knew the words of God. They knew that there was one coming after them. And, and guess what? He was standing right in front of them, but because he didn't come the way they thought he should, because he didn't look the way they thought he should, they said, this ain't him. They thought Jesus should come in riding a white stallion and saving the world, but instead he come in riding on a donkey, come to lay down his life. They thought he should do things a certain way and look a certain way and dress a certain way, but guess what? He did it the exact opposite. And so they said, this can't be him. They shut him out. Listen to me. Jesus does things every day in front of us and we shut him out because it ain't the way we thought it should happen. God keeps you alive every day and we don't even give him a moment to thank you for it. And we shut him out because he don't do things the way we think he should. That's right. I'm going to move on. And so he goes on right here. He said, all the things that the prophets had said has been fulfilled. Verse 19, he said this, Repent you therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Boy, we could stop right there and preach all night long. Hallelujah. He said right here, Repent and be converted. What does the word repent mean? Repent. It means to, to ask God for forgiveness. It means to turn from your wicked ways. To have a change of mind. A change of heart. It's not to say, God, I'm sorry. And then going back 15 minutes later and doing the same thing. That's not repentance. That's a form of religion, matter of fact. But anyway, we can go on. Repentance is a sincerity. A deep 
heartfelt sincerity where you say, God, I know what I did was wrong. Please forgive me. I'm turning around. I'm changing my ways. I don't want to do that anymore. That's what true repentance is. And when you do that, when you come to God, you will be converted. Hallelujah. You will be changed in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. And it says right here, be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Ain't you happy tonight to know that your sins have been blotted out? Praise the Lord. We all be shouting right now. Jesus said that his blood will cover a multitude of sins and said that I'll cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against you again. Listen to me, if God cast our sins as far as the east is from the west, if God gets rid of our sins, never to bring them up against you again, then why can we not let it go? The devil makes you bring things back up, and he wants you to bring things back up, and he wants to throw it in your face. But God's already got rid of it. You just tell the devil he is a liar. And those sins that you used to do in your past, you don't do them anymore. And God has already covered them by his blood. Amen. Amen. Never to be remembered against you again. But too many times God can forgive us, but we can't forgive ourselves. We've got to understand, look, God's forgiveness. We can forgive ourselves. You're a new creature now. You're not the same person you used to be. Because once you repent, once you become converted, you are a new creature in Almighty God. You're not the same person. You've been regenerated. I like to say regenerated. In other words, he's took out your old genes and put in his genes. Amen. I used to have my damn genes. I used to, when I followed the devil, I used to like to lie, and I used to like to gamble, and I used to like to do this. But then God took those genes out and put his genes in. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I got my father's genes. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I don't like to lie. Amen. I don't like to gamble now. But I like to praise the Lord. Amen. I like to read my Bible. I like to help somebody. I like to love on somebody. Hallelujah. Why? Because Amen. I've been regenerated. I'm another person now. Amen. And you are too. Amen. Once God does this thing with you, you'll never be the same. Hallelujah. Ever be the same. He's blotted them out. And he said, when the time of refreshing shall come. Amen. Is anybody feeling refreshed in here tonight? Amen. Are you feeling refreshed? That's what I love about coming to God's house and getting with God's people and letting the Spirit have control is that you will get refreshed. Unlike anything, we can drink five pots of coffee up here and we're not going to feel refreshed. We're going to feel like uh, it's weaker or something. But when God gets a hold of you, hallelujah, when God gets a hold of you, that no, that refreshing rain from heaven begins to fall. There's nothing like it. Hallelujah. There is no peace, no calm, no strength like God can give. Amen. Amen. And the refreshing, I love it, shall come from the presence of the Lord. And his presence is out here in this place tonight. Amen. Amen. That's why we get refreshed because he's in the house. Verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which was before preached to you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. In other words, Jesus is going to have to go away for a little while. We started out in Acts 1 and it said that Jesus was rising up at his ascension. He was going up into heaven, but he was speaking to him the whole time. He said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Hallelujah. I'm always going to be with you. I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. Hallelujah. Then the angels began to speak. Remember what they said. They said, This same Jesus that you see going into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go. In other words, just as you see him go, you're going to see him coming back the same way. Hallelujah. He will come and he will come home looking for his children. He will sound the trumpet. He will sound the alarm. Hallelujah. He will look for his church. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. And he said the heaven must receive him until the time of restitution of all things. Listen, that's what's happening right now. Everything that's going on in the world. God has given everybody an opportunity to get saved before he shows back up. God's not willing that any should perish or that anybody should go to hell. God wants everybody in heaven. He don't want to send nobody to hell. But you know what? They send themselves there when they reject him. And God's given everybody an opportunity to get saved. 
And so he's waiting. There's a time of restitution of all things that God has spoken of in the Old Testament by his holy prophets. In verse 22, it says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. In other words, he's saying right here, Jesus, a prophet, a great prophet, is going to be rose up. He's going to come up right in front of you. He's going to be standing right in front of you. And Moses, he talked about it. See, all these people were Jewish, most every one of them that are here right now. And that was their person. Moses was their man that they looked up to. Moses and David, that was two of the, the men that they looked up to in their lives. They all looked up to him. So when Peter spoke right here, he said, this is what Moses said. They looked at Father Abraham and Moses and David. They looked at them. They was their spiritual giants. And so he said, this is what he said. A prophet's going to be rose up, and you shall listen to everything that he says. And he said, the people that don't listen to him shall be destroyed from among the people. In verse 24, he said, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. These prophets in the Old Testament, they told them everything that was going to happen. They told them how it was going to come. They told them he was going to come in lowly, riding on a donkey. They told them that he was going to raise up as a tender plant. He was going to come up just as a kid and, and raise up into a man. And, oh, they told them everything. But they got so tied up in their religion that they missed the whole thing that God had said to them. That's why it's so important that we don't get messed up and tied up in religion. We just follow what the Word says and have a relationship with God. Because I don't want to miss the Holy One. I don't want to miss God. I don't want to miss Jesus standing right in front of us. Amen. And it says this. Verse 25. We're almost done tonight. There's one more after this. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Hallelujah. God told Abraham, through your seed, you know, Abraham was a hundred years old and they didn't even have kids yet. Y'all remember the story? And God come along and told him, He said, You're going to have a child. And Sarah laughed and, and so on. And they're like, I'm a hundred year old. God, are you crazy? I can't have kids at a hundred year old. What are you thinking? And so God got mad with them. You know, because they, they doubted God. Church, we do the same thing. We, we're giggling right now, but we actually do the same thing. God says, I'm going to make a way where there seems to be no way. And we say, God, what are you thinking? You can't do that. Come on, brother. It's God. The Bible said nothing is impossible with God. But all things are possible through Christ Jesus. Amen. We, just, we can't wrap our human minds around it. But he said, every one of your seed is going to be blessed, Abraham. And we know that Abraham, he had Isaac, and they had Jacob, and, and so on and so on. And the seed began to multiply as the sands of the seashore, as the stars of heaven. Abraham's seed was blessed all the way from him, all the way down the line, through David, all the way to Jesus. And still, they are blessed because God made that promise to Abraham. And God, when he makes a promise to his children, it don't go away. He said, this is an everlasting promise. And church, he's made an everlasting promise to us that he will come again. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. But he's coming back one day. He's coming after a people that's made their self ready. And that didn't go out five years ago. God didn't change his mind and fall asleep. But it's an everlasting promise. That means as soon as it gets time, as soon as God says, Son, go get your children, Jesus will step out. And with the sound of the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ will rise. And all those that are alive and remain shall be called up in the Lord in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's an everlasting promise. We have a hope that the world does not have. Hallelujah. They think when they die, we're going to learn about it next week. We was going to get more into it this week, and I was really hoping to get to chapter 4, but next week, y'all, don't want to miss it. I'm not just trying to tell you that so you'll be here. I'm really saying you don't want to miss next week. And it's going to be a powerful, powerful lesson. Amen. I wanted to get to it tonight, but the Lord had other plans. And it says, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed unto you. First God, having raised up his son Jesus, he sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Hallelujah. 
In other words, what Peter was telling them right there, this was one of Peter's you know, sermons that he preached, one of the first and second sermons that Peter ever preached. Amen. One of the first sermons that he ever preached, I believe it was. And he told them, he said, the one that you crucified, the one that y'all killed, the one that you said give us the murderer and take Jesus, he said he come to forgive you of your iniquities, to cleanse you, to live for you, to die for you. And he's telling them right here, that's the one that you crucified. Amen. You know what? And they was all thinking, imagine how that would be when just a few days ago you was yelling out, crucify Jesus, get rid of him. We don't want this man. We've seen the good that he's done, but we don't, we don't want him here. He's messing everything up that we got going. And now you come to find out and you come to understand that Jesus the whole time had come to lay down his life for you. Amen. You know what? That's the way a lot of people is in the world today. They say, we don't have room for Jesus in our life. We don't have room for him. We don't want him in our life. Some people just tell you straight up, we don't want him in our life. We can't do what we want to do then. And they say, we don't want Jesus. They're still rejecting him today. But the truth of the matter is, Jesus come and died for them to save them from their sin, just like he did us. Do you think just because we're Christians, we're not holier than they are, I promise you. We're no better than anybody else. Even the Muslims over there that's blowing people up every day, God come for them just like he did for us. We're no better than they are. They're God's children. We're God's children. And hallelujah. If they fall down on their knees and say, God, forgive me for my sins, just like they had, God will forgive them. Not even a question asked. Think about the thief on the cross. And I'm going to close with this. Thief on the cross. He didn't have to go get down, get baptized, and go to church and do all this stuff. Did he know? He said, Lord, remember me today. Remember me today when you enter into paradise. And what did Jesus tell him? He said, this day. This day, son, you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. You know, we make things so much harder. God has made it so easy. If you accept and believe and confess him, he said he'll come in and be the Lord of your life. Amen. Jesus said, Revelation 3.10, Behold, I stand at the door knocking. He's knocking at our heart's door. He said, If any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. I will be his God and he will be my son and he will be my, she will be my daughter. I will be their God. And they'll be my people. Make Hallelujah. He makes it easy. Good. He makes it easy. Mm -hmm. We make things hard on ourselves. Mm -hmm. we, we make things difficult. Mm -hmm. God just wants you to believe him. Mm -hmm. God just wants you to confess him. He just wants you to have a relationship with him. He be his friend. That's what God wants. Mm -hmm. He wants a friend. He wants a son and a daughter that loves him for who he is. That's not what he can give. Mm -hmm. Amen. I thank God tonight. And if there's somebody here that don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he come to forgive you of your sins. He come to forgive me of my sins. He come to live for us, but he come to die for us. He come and he resurrected for us. Amen. He's ascended for us. Now he's in heaven praying for us. And one day he's coming back for us. Amen. Amen. And on that day, everything will be all. He said, I'll make all things new. Praise the Lord. Would you stand with us all over the house?